When you first started out more than a decade ago in SAID Kits, did you envision a multi-continental proliferation of CIP programs all along? Or is this a path that has developed along the way as you realize the extent of demand for these types of products? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that we didn't start with SAID Kits. You know? Even 10 years before that, we worked in many countries, Austria, one of them, we did a lot. Um, and we did a lot with investor immigration programs such as Canada, but also in Singapore, for instance, and in Switzerland and so on. So what happened in St. Kitts is simply that we made a previously not really sca scalable program into a scalable product. Right. And a few factors that happened at the same time, which I would say we saw coming as well, like the closing of the Canadian program and you know, a couple other shifts that then made it very attractive to move some of this to St. Kitts, but also some other countries. So essentially, to, ex to an extent, I would say there was, there was some foresight, and then to another extent, as we went along and as we first needed to see also whether it really can be scalable to that extent, we saw the potential as it grew. So it's a little bit of both, as most of the time in life. Good. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the future of this industry. <coughs> Ten years from now, what do you think the CIP market is going to look like? Do you think we'll see more Caribbean or EU state CIPs? Uh, or perhaps in the Pacific Islands, where they have a lot of the same preconditions in place, such as Schengen access and common law jurisdictions and English as an official language. No, totally. what, what's your prediction? Well, I think on one hand what is very clear is that the global demand continues to expand. So there's a lot more people that are looking for that. Um, and I think there are two important factors here on the demand side. And that's one, there is an incredible increase in wealth around the world so there's more and more people that can actually afford such things and secondly it has become um, I would say mainstream you know where maybe 10 years ago even you know to acquire a second passport was maybe considered a little bit hmm, adventurous adventurous yeah. let's say whereas now in the wealth management industry wealthy people around the world is completely normal to talk about it and I think in the future it will be a, a standard thing to do so the demand side is expanding but also what we see is that the supply side is expanding and I think there certainly our firm has pioneered with countries around the world um, to really use such programs, both investment uh, residents and investment synergy programs, um, as legitimate tools for boosting foreign direct investment. And that is something which I think is also going to further expand. So in 10 years, I think we'll see a lot more countries, and not just in the Pacific or Caribbean, but all over the world, that will adopt this uh, interesting tool. Yeah. Do you anticipate that prices will continue to fall for CIPs? Uh, so I mean the, the cost of entry, will it, will it continue to fall as new entrants continue to enter the market? Or do you think that jurisdictions will mainly try to compete on quality rather than price? Yeah, I think it's always a question what product you have to offer. So the price is only one uh, determinant. It's like with any other market and any other products. And so I think there is a certain tendency, of course, yeah. particularly amongst very similar programs, let's say intra-Caribbean. Substitute goods. Unfortunately, to go a little bit, um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it race to the bottom, but it's a, a little bit a tendency, which I would very much like to see reversed. Mm -hmm. But as long as you have players that don't play along, I mean countries that just keep it low, others have no other choice than also keep it low you know so or go lower well, you, and you would need a cartel I suppose almost yeah it. at least a certain understanding yeah, that yeah. there's a certain minimum threshold because it's fairly artificial pricing I would say yeah. Yeah. Well, on the other hand it's not just 
the cost or the price, it's also how efficient it is, the reputation of the country, um, the, I would say the quality of the application process, yeah. what kind of questions are asked, what kind of due diligence is required, and what kind of people are admitted. You know, wealthy people that are looking for this product, they want to be sure that others that are in the same club, let's say, mm. are not you know, shady people. Sure. And so if a country starts to let in too many unsavory characters, then by, na by nature that cheapens the thing. And then these are also factors that are important. And that's why we see, for example, the Malta program is so successful. It is by far the most difficult and by far the most expensive. Yeah. But if you make it into Malta, yeah. you know you are in a very exclusive, exclusive club. club. Yeah. And it's, so it's a, like a luxury good, you know or a Veblen good, you know, in economic terms, yeah. that actually the more expensive, the more difficult, it may become more attractive. Yes. So it's not just about that it's getting more uh, more cheap or so. It's actually, you know, you can very well position a product expensive and complicated if you have the right, like Malta is a good example. Yeah. Which risk factors do you think uh, are the greatest in terms of obstructing the proliferation of CIP and RBI? programs, uh, OECD, supranational organizations like that, popular opposition maybe, or inadequate due diligence? Yeah, I think like with everything else, you know, it's, it's a matter of how these things are done. Okay? I don't think, frankly, that the OECD or large countries like the United States have anything per se against other countries offering residence or even citizenship. Uh, for investment, mm -hmm. but you know you need to do it properly. It's a little bit like in the in the extraction industry, for example, in oil and gas. Mm -hmm. You know you have countries, um, say like Norway or Canada, or you have you know Russia and Nigeria. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and so it depends. You can run it like Norway, you know, or you can run it like another country and. You know, this is the choice of countries, and it's the choice of clients, it's the choice of uh, intermediaries, and so it's like in any other industry, there is a spectrum. Right. Thanks to the CIP industry, the concept of citizenship has changed drastically in the last decade. It's taken <coughs> on a whole new meaning. How do you personally define the concept of citizenship today, and how would you like it to be defined in the future? Do you perhaps foresee a world in which economic citizenship becomes the standard rather than the exception? Uh, or where countries must compete for capital and increasingly mobile talent by becoming better places to live and work? Yeah, I see. Obviously, you know, you can take uh, different views on this. And obviously also, you know, our view is more progressive. We are in many ways pioneers and we basically say and think that what we're doing is already more or less a reality. More than half of the countries in the world, they are not liberal democratic societies where citizenship as such has any value. If you're a citizen of, let's say, North Korea, there's not many rights you have. There's not, you basically are a receiver of orders or uh, I wouldn't, you know, no offense, but it's a different thing if you're a citizen in Germany or if you're a citizen in North Korea, you agree. So over half the countries in the world, citizenship has many different meanings, but not the one that this romantic, liberal, democratic idea yeah. comes from. Yeah. And then if you look at the liberal democratic countries, so there where we're talking about or we could talk about what notion of citizenship, what is citizenship about, you have to understand that today the fact is already that the majority, overwhelming majority of the population in those countries, they actually view citizenship more like a club membership. Because if you look at who goes to vote, who, ac who actually participates very few people actually go and vote. Okay? And then if there is very good studies and political scientists, uh, you know, analyze this very carefully, very good studies that show that those even who go and vote, if you interview them and s look at what exactly their understanding is of the political process, is very, very bad. So if you look at the United States yeah. or Germany, even it's unbelievable how people don't actually understand what they're doing. So their political rights and their citizenship rights it's really reduced to what do they pay and what do they get. That's what people are interested in. This romantic idea of citizen 
comes from a previous time. It comes from when we've had, you know, citizen armies, you know, in the French Revolution, where everyone took up arms. You know, and then it's logical you can't be a citizen of Germany and the United States if they are at war. Right. Okay? But now we have much less wars, or not this type of national wars that we had in the past. We have largely professional armies, so military service is no longer an issue. And citizenship was very much tied to military service. So now all these things, they're gone. Now citizenship is basically a club. And then, if you look at it this way, which is, as I said, it's not just my opinion, it's actually a fact. The fact is that people look at it like this. And if you look at it like this, you know, what prevents you from offering this club membership to suitable, talented and wealthy people to enter the club for the benefit of everyone that is there? Why not? Right. And then this club membership has a price, like, like if you join a golf club. Yeah. Okay? And this is how I see the future of, of citizenship very much so. Of course, not, not without bias here, <laughs> of course, but there are some very strong facts that that support that actually. Yeah. I want to speak to you very briefly about your recent appearance on CBS's 60 Minutes uh, because to many of those uh, uh, like myself who work in this industry and who know what the due diligence requirements are and the, the work that goes into it, it seemed like a very unfair characterization uh, of the industry as a whole. Um, so it's it sens sensationalized and it hinted vaguely at foul play without providing any actual evidence for that. So I'd like to ask you, why do you think that this once venerable institution of reporting chose to portray the industry in such a negative light? Do you think it's simply that the press considers it its mandate to focus on the dark side of everything? Or do you think there were other factors that motivated this hatchet job, I would say? Yeah, there's some interesting conspiracy theories floating around, including that we were behind this thing, which is complete absurdity. I mean, I can't imagine anyone in their sane mind actually thinking uh, like this. But, you know, I, my experience with journalists, um, although I was also a bit surprised because 60 minutes I would have expected a little bit more thoroughness. And they did a very thorough, I mean, they did a year and a half research. They went to every country, also to Malta, to Cyprus. They interviewed dozens of people. In the end, they chose to primarily focus around us. Of course, that's also not a surprise because we are by far the leading company in this business. So naturally, if you're a journalist, you probably want to talk to those guys. Mm -hmm. And also, very unfortunately, they focused on the Caribbean in a very negative way, which also disturbed me because it's really, to a large extent, untrue what they said and to a large extent, very unfair. Because I would think a little bit more balanced. Yes, you can criticize certain things, but what is really not true is that, you know, there's a lack of due diligence. There's, I mean, a lot of things are really nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I would have also expected the better, um, better journalism from, from that. Yeah. But that's sometimes, you know, journalists like to spin things a bit negative some time they could have focused on Malta you know yeah I don't know you know it's difficult to say yeah. um, I think as far as we are concerned it was quite okay I think we came away quite balanced mm -hmm. um, but overall I'm not happy the way yeah. this was portrayed right. but you know we will have more to expect like this you know when when you pioneer things <laughs> You know, you get criticized, you know, of course it's normal, but everything is like this. No you know? good deed goes unpunished. Yeah, and then in the end, you know, people will be with you, but it takes a while, yeah. you know. They say that all publicity is good publicity. Now, do you think the 60 Minutes segment was, on the whole, beneficial to the industry despite the unflattering portrayal, in as much as it exposed the industry to a wider audience. Yeah, of course, it increased business. So from that point of view, yeah. <laughs> and even, you know, I talked to my Caribbean friends and they all said, you know, after 60 minutes, of course, because it's a lot of connection between Caribbean and North America, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of phone calls from the US. Yeah. People wanted to, well, interesting, right. you know, <laughs> wanted to proceed with it. So from that point of view, it actually was, was good. But, yeah. you know, I think we cannot prevent also in the future we cannot prevent mainstream media to report sometimes negatively at best quite balanced mm. but you will probably for some time not find terribly many that will portray it positively yeah. because there's always this connotation and it's nice to spin a little bit you know selling of passports yeah. over time people will realize what positive effects these things have and if properly managed and here I totally agree with policymakers and journalists it's a question if things are done properly, mm -hmm. 
then it's very good. And if, of course, things are not done properly, yeah, the, you have good grounds to criticize. So I do hope that more and more people realize this, and, and I'm pretty sure over time, you know, this will take care of itself. Dr. Caleb, good. thank you so much thank for you taking too. the time. Yes, likewise. Thank you. Thank you.